Hello everyone and welcome back to the world of finance. You are watching Finance Concepts with Nikhil. Friends, uh, let us take up an important topic for our discussion today that is titled as Risk, Return and Portfolio Theory. So as you can look into this title, it comprises of three terms, Risk, Return and Portfolio Theory. So let us first analyze this title. Let us first understand this title. The term Risk and Return. These are indicators of uh, objectives of an investor. So if you look into any investor, any kind of investor will have two typical objectives, maximizing his or her returns and on the other side minimizing the risk. So you ask any investor what kind of returns you would want to earn, low or high, who is going to say low returns? Everyone is aiming at good returns, high returns. You ask an investor what degree of risk you would want to take, low or high. Why someone would unnecessarily take high risk? Anyone would want to take lowest possible risk. But there is a tragedy my friend over here. Risk and returns are two components that will move in the same direction. So just take an example. You want to earn high returns, you make investments in stock market. You make investments in stock market where you have definitely good chances, good potential of earning high returns. But that high return is going to come to you with a high degree of risk as well. So high returns, but high risk. So high return will be a positive factor. High risk over there will be putting you into little troubles. It is going against your objective. On the other side, you think of investing in debt market or bond market. Investing in debt market or bond market will definitely minimize the risk degree. The degree of risk that you will take will be minimal. But my friends, you will have to compromise with low returns. Basically, someone who doesn't want to take any risk would simply make investment, not even in a debt market, would simply go and put his or her money in banks fixed deposit. You know, in India, we have banking based economy. So banks are always most preferred and therefore any investor to have lowest possible risk would approach a bank, put their money in banks fixed deposit. But doing so, you are compromising with your rate of return. Look into what kind of rate of return bonds, debentures or any debt instrument or even banks fixed deposit is going to offer to you. This is going to offer at current level hardly 6 to 7 percent and look into what is the rate of inflation right now in India. Right now inflation rate itself is around 7 percent. So actually banks fixed deposit or the coupon payment on any bond or debenture any kind of interest payment on such debt instrument is hardly going to compensate you for this inflation. Forget about earning anything out of that. You put your money today on maturity when you get your money back, what will happen? You are just going to get back your money with a little compensation to the inflation. Actually speaking, you are not going to earn any returns. So my friends, the idea is what? If you are investing in stock market, you have good returns, high returns, but associated with high risk. You invest in debt market or bond market, you have low risk, but then you are compromising with low returns. So what we have to do? Therefore, we are definitely not focusing on bond market. Our focus is just and just on stock market. So what's the problem? In stock market, one objective is definitely achieved. That is what? High returns. What is the other objective? To minimize the risk, which is not happening in stock market. It is not happening to the extent you are investing in a single security. The moment you have a diversified investment portfolio in stock market, it is going to balance out your risk equation. It is going to have minimum risk for you if you have a diversified portfolio. And therefore, what you can do with a portfolio 
cannot be done by a single investment or a single security. So what I'm trying to tell you is we are not focusing on banks deposits or bond market and debt market. We are focusing definitely on stock market. So what happens? Not on a single security that we are planning to invest. We are planning to invest in a portfolio. So what is this portfolio? Portfolio is a combination. It's a group of investments. Now these investments are obviously diversified kind of investments. That means you have investment in different sectors. Investing in different sectors, putting all your money into one thing could be hazardous. Rather I would say allocating your capital smartly on different stocks which are of diversified nature and creating a smart portfolio, managing actively that portfolio is what we are aiming at. So friends, in this title, risk return and portfolio theory, risk and returns are the objectives of our investor and portfolio is the means through which this objective will be achieved. So just pay attention on the screen and I'll show you something important. Let us quickly recap what we have just discussed. Investment objectives. One would be maximization of returns and the other would be minimization of risk. And say you think of investing in stock market, you will be benefited with high returns, but there will be trouble of high risk as well. Investing in bond market will give you ease with respect to low risk, but you will have to compromise with low returns. So you may understand one thing very well that two objectives, maximization of returns and minimization of risk on overall basis both of these objectives are not being achieved one of the objectives you are ending up compromising when you invest in stock or bond market so we can say that we have conflicts in objectives so what we need to understand now is that we continue to think of investing in stock market but not in single security because investing in single security you cannot achieve the objectives and therefore there is a need to create an investment portfolio. So when you talk about investment portfolio as a whole subject matter, how are we going to approach this whole thing? Let us plan that first. First, what we are going to do is divide this whole discussion into two different segments, two different parts. The first part will be talking about analysis of risk and returns. And then the second part will be introduction to portfolio concepts. That means in the first part, when you're talking about analysis of risk and returns, we are not talking about anything relating to portfolio. We will not touch the concept of portfolio. There we are focusing only on a single security. So at the first part, we will analyze returns of a single security followed by risk with respect to an individual security, all types of risks, all forms of risks. And then finally, once we are done with application of all these concepts on a single security, then we will apply the whole thing on portfolio. But friends, the important thing is what is meant by a single security over here? Let me tell you one thing very clearly. We are not talking about investing in bonds and debentures that is we are not talking about investing in fixed income kind of security so bonds debentures and preference shares are out of the scope of discussion we are mainly going to concern ourselves with only one type of security that is equity share and that is what we are pulling the concept of equity analysis and valuation as the first matter to discuss. So let us begin with equity analysis and valuation. So getting started with concept number one that is rate of return on a single security. Never to forget what is the meaning of single security over here it necessarily means an equity share only and therefore we are talking about equity analysis and valuation that is basically share valuation. So when it comes to share valuation, this is nothing new for you. You have been learning about this earlier as well. This what you find on screen is the most fundamental approach for determining value of an equity share. 
p0 equals to d1 plus p1 upon 1 plus k. Let us try to understand what is this. d1 and p1 appear to be future cash flows and p0 indicates the present value of that future cash flow. Let us break it down in more simple terms. Assume that the investor has invested today at a price which is prevailing in the stock market today obviously which is P0. So, what money that the investor has placed as an investment from his or her pocket is P0. Now, what will happen why an equity share was purchased today with two aspirations expectation of receiving some dividend and expectation of increase in the share price. Assume that the investor is planning to just have an investment horizon of one year. So, what will happen after one year at the end of the year the investor is expecting some dividend and expecting some encashment on sale of the share. So, basically by end of the year what do you find as wealth in the hands of the investor D1 cash dividend and P1 which is nothing but the value of the share on that day. So, D1 plus P1 is the total wealth in the hands of the investor after one year. The present value of the share if you want to find out divide that future wealth by 1 plus expected rate of return and friends the expected rate of return with respect to an equity shareholder is symbolized as a KE. This is what you have been learning always KE from the viewpoint of the company indicates cost of equity, but from the viewpoint of investor it is nothing but an expected rate of return. So, what we are simply trying to do over here is determining the present value of future cash flow. So, what we have just discussed in this formula D1 and P1 appear to be the future wealth in the hands of the investor or the same can be even identified as future cash flows because if you are investing for a time horizon of just one year this whole wealth can be encashed and we may call this as future cash flows. Our objective is to arrive at P0 which is nothing but the present value of this future cash flow. So, applying concepts of time value of money this is the future wealth in hand or future cash flow divide this by 1 plus expected rate of return what we generally call as 1 plus i here expected rate of return has been symbolized as k. So, k indicates expected rate of return for the investor and eventually p0 would be nothing but the present value of future cash flows. So, let us understand the meaning of all these variables as well. So, what you would do? P0 equals to D1 plus P1 upon 1 plus KE where D1 is expected dividend receivable by year end, P1 is expected market price of equity share by year end, KE is expected rate of return by the equity shareholder. The same can be also called as equity capitalization rate or cost of equity for the company and P0 is the current market price of equity share. So, let us move ahead and analyze something more out of this basic formula that is P0 equals to D1 plus P1 upon 1 plus KE. So, what we just do is we cross multiply we take 1 plus KE to the left hand side what we get is 1 plus KE and in the right hand side we would find D1 plus P1 as it is but divided by P0. So, P0 coming this side over here. So, 1 plus KE is D1 plus P1 upon P0. So, if you would want to determine KE simply what you would do is k equals to d1 plus p1 upon p0 and from this whole thing subtract 1. So, 1 from here goes again back to the right hand side and becomes minus 1. So, if I now want to include this minus 1 within this bracket where the denominator is p0 I would rewrite this whole equation as k equals to d1 plus p1 minus p0 upon p0 because P0 upon P0 is nothing but 1. Instead of minus 1, we have written minus P0 upon P0. Now, let us split this whole term and rewrite the equation as K equals to D1 upon P0 plus P1 minus P0 upon P0. So, what we identify 
P1 minus P0 upon P0 will become nothing but a growth rate. So, growth rate is symbolized as G, where G actually means P1 minus P0 divided by P0. Let us try to substitute this whole thing over here. In place of P1 minus P0 upon P0, we better write up G. So, what we get is the core formula for determining the cost of equity and this is nothing but the expected rate of return for the equity shareholder and that is k equals to d1 by p0 plus g so what is d1 what is p0 we have already understood and g over here indicates growth rate and the manner in which you compute growth rate is p1 minus p0 upon p0 moving ahead from here we would analyze this formula once again if we simply take g from right hand side to left hand side what we get is k minus g and over right hand side we will be getting d1 by p0 and now when you cross multiply this p0 comes here in the left hand side and k minus g comes over here in the right hand side as denominator so what we get is p0 equals to d1 upon k minus g now what we have always learned this as Gordon's model for determining the value of the share. So, P0 is the present value of the share. To determine this, you have to divide the expected dividend by difference between the expected rate of return and growth rate. And this is what we call as Gordon's model. Moving ahead, what we do is, we explore some details about Gordon's model that what exactly this is trying to convey. So, first of all, we write up the meaning of all these variables. You know D1, K, P0, all these things. G stands for growth rate. So, what we are trying to do further is, we would say growth rate G is B into R. Now, this is something different what we have typically learnt in Gordon's model. Let me just remind you what is B and R standing for. G obviously stands for growth rate. R is the return on equity and B is the retention ratio. Retention ratio is nothing but 1 minus dividend payout ratio. So friends, in the share valuation topic, we have discussed that multiplication of B and R, that is these two factors, will eventually give you growth rate. Same growth rate which can also be determined through P1 minus P0 divided by P0. So I am not repeating all these concepts over here because we have discussed the same in the share valuation topic. So when we write k equals to d1 by p0 plus g, d1 by p0 indicates dividend yield rate and g indicates growth rate. The expected rate of return by the equity shareholder is the aggregate of two components that is dividend yield rate and growth rate. So you should always understand it this way that k is aggregate of these two rates d1 by p0 is the dividend yield rate and g stands for growth rate if you are investing at p0 price and expecting a dividend of d1 after one year this is the part of rate of return which is indicated as dividend yield rate that means this much you are earning by way of dividend and this much you are earning by way of growth in the share price your overall earnings is the aggregate of these two components.